continuing capital in the present. Um, and there's a certain pair of words that will involve, that will, I hope, come out in the, in the course of time. Um, the idea of continuing capital <coughs> built into Marx's method. Marx's method, as we touched on yesterday morning, is a method, as he puts it famously in the 1857 introduction, of moving from the abstract to the concrete, which becomes, by the time we get to the final versions of the three volumes of capital, the progressive introduction of ever more concrete determinations. I don't have time to go into this, but the movement from the very abstract concepts uh, in chapter one, volume one on commodity, the movement from those to all the complexities of um, landed property, financial markets, and so on, that we have in the third one. The ordering is important, starting from the abstract, but <coughs> the, the more abstract concepts, the commodity, labor power, value, etc., define the basic structure. And step by step, but although it should be clear from yesterday and there's nothing in the back how he does this, step by step, Mark fills in um, uh, um, an outline of capitalism as a concrete totality. <coughs> but it's a process that perfectly well could, could continue indefinitely. That's implicit in the famous incomplete sixth, sixth book plan. And it's something that he says himself in a letter to Kugel uh, in 1862, where he premature, rather prematurely announces the completion of capital. He says, what Englishmen call the principles of political economy is contained in this volume. It is the quintessence uh, and the development of the sequel, with the exception, perhaps, of the relationship between the various forms of state and the various economic structures society could easily be pursued uh, by others on the, on the basis that's provided. Now it's very intriguing, the idea that Marx planned whatever else he wasn't going to do, and account of the relationship between the economic structures and forms of state. But of course, he, he never did it. But the implication is, capital is just the beginning of an intellectual project that others continue. It's the beginning of a, of a collective project. Now we know what happens, how capital is continued in the early part of the uh, 20th century, how it's continued. It's continued through the development of the theory of imperialism, which is one of Marxism's great intellectual achievements. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to consider another reader in particular of uh, capital, who in his year of anniversaries died in the years ago, namely Antonio Gramsci. Because Gramsci, very unusually, among the Marxists of the second and third international, takes Marxist analysis of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall very seriously and uses it to read the concrete political economic trend of the day. So he doesn't develop the idea of a specific phase of capitalist economic Rather, he goes from Marx's analysis in Capital, volume three, part three, and uses that to try and make sense of what's happening. He, his main discussion of the tendency of the rate of crime before comes in April 10, where he's carrying on a critique of Benedetto Croce, the great Italian liberal philosopher, who Gramsci sees as the theorist of passive revolution, in other words, in a different way to the bourgeois society, tries to reconstruct itself in the face of what he calls this organic crisis. And Crochet's critique of Marx is um, very, very much says, uh, states a series of criticisms that have been repeated ever since. If you read Gareth Stedman Jones' contemporary criticism of Marx, really they repeat, which uh, repeats the plot of my Crochet. And there's this fascinating passage where um, Gramsci says, in the case of the falling rate of profit, uh, 
we have presented as uh, the, the, the law, the tangential law of the Court of Merit Property, is presented as a contradictory aspect of another law, that of the production of surplus land. In this situation, one law tends to cancel the other, with the prediction that the form in the rate of profit will be the prevailing one. When can one imagine the contradiction reaching its Gordian dots, a normally insoluble class requiring the intervention of Alexander the Great with his sword, when the whole world economy has become capitalist and reached a certain level of development, i.e. when the mobile frontier of the capitalist economic road has reached its pillars of hope. The counteracting forces of the tendential law, which are summed up in the production of an ever greater relative certain value, have limits, which are given, for example, uh, technically. Uh, that's to say, the, although it's not clear that, that this follows, the economic contradiction becomes a political contradiction, which is resolved politically by overbrain factors. Now, I think that's a very, very interesting fact. First of all, it shows that Gramsci is a very sophisticated understanding of Marx's law of the He understands it um, uh, as essentially the interaction of the tendency with the counteracting tendency. So that one can't understand the tendency except in the context of how it interacts with the counteracting tendencies. And this is something that a number of contemporary Marxists have tried to argue, although often But it's also very interesting that the strategy, the key kind of tendency, is uh, capitalists in increasing relative surplus value. And he focuses on the mechanism that Marx sets out, so many other the reasons that I don't have time to talk about, in chapter 12 of Capital Volume 1, where individual capitals one, two, introduce one, innovations that reduce their cost of one, two, and thereby gain super profits until their advantage is eliminated by uh, when other capitals adopt this innovation. And Gramsci, I think rightly, sees this as the key mechanism through which relative surplus value is uh, extracted. He says, the most effective means for individual entrepreneurs to escape the law of the falling rate of profit is that of constantly introducing new forward-looking changes in all aspects of work and production without neglecting the smallest contributions to progress that in the really great vast enterprises when multiplied on the grand scale give rise to very appreciable results. Henry Ford's whole industrial activity can be studied from this point of view. A continual incessant struggle to escape the law of falling rates of profit by maintaining a position of superiority over his, his competitors. So that's really interesting because one of the most famous parts of the Gramsci's discussion in the prison notebooks is that of what he calls Americanism and, and Fordism. But what he says in this passage is that what he broadly understands as uh, Fordism, it, uh, as Americanism, which in this case includes both Fordism and Fordism, um, and which, along with fascism, represents for him the main forms of the passive revolution of uh, his day, of the attempts by capitalism to reconstruct itself. Both uh, Americanism and fascism represent the responses to the falling rate of profit.
but as um, associated with new deal liberalism, um, as which uh, has to be understood from Gramsci's perspective as the antithesis to fascism, uh, as the two main strategies for reconstructing uh, capitalism in the face of its crisis. Okay, moving on. Um, now, I think there are a number of important points to, to, to make here. I mean, it's worth noting the passage which I quoted, where Gramsci talks about the economic contradictions becoming um, 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 uh, political contradiction that is resolved um, by overthrowing practice. Because here, Gramsci is talking about continuing capital, not just intellectually, but in the domain, the domain of practice. So that the resolution, the ultimate resolution of the falling rate of profit, the interplay of tendencies and counter tendencies, is through, um, is through um, revolutionizing practice, as, as Marx, uh, as Marx uh, puts it. It's, it's a political struggle, and it's a political struggle that Gramsci talks about at great length in other parts of the prison networks, in particular the struggle for hegemony, uh, where hegemony is understood in particular as involving a project, what, what Gramsci calls an ethico-political project, <laughs> Uh, a project that can't be reduced simply to the economic struggle, but involves a whole program of reconstructing society and a series of concrete conceptions through which the mass of the population can be won either actively or passively to endorse that conception and to accept the root of the class, in Grouchy's case, of course, the working class, that is seeking to involved in the project. So when Grouchy talks about overthrowing or revolutionizing practice, that's what he's referring to, the hegemonic project of the working class that is, is his life's work and is what he focuses the prison on. So, um, but I think what's also worth stressing here is, so on the one hand we see Gramsci going beyond Marx in integrating political struggles, including the highest level of political struggle, namely the struggle for hegemony, into the play of tendency and counter tendency. But I think it's also, um, we can also see his discussion of falling rate of profit as throwing a different light on some of the most famous passages in prison. There's a famous passage when a crisis occurs sometimes lasting for decades. This exceptional duration means that incurable structural contradictions have revealed themselves, and that despite this, the political forces which are struggling to conserve and defend the existing structure itself are making effort, every effort to cure them with certain limits and to overcome them. These are incessant and persistent efforts form the terrain of the conjunctural, and it is upon this terrain that the forces of opposition um, uh, or, organized. Now, this um, passage, among other things, shows that, Mark, that Gramsci isn't an economic reduction because what the crisis does is to create a situation in which different class forces can fight for their different so solutions. In Gramsci's case, socialist revolution that overthrows bourgeois society or a passive revolution that reconstructs bourgeois society. But it seems to me that this passage has to be read in the light of what he says about the falling rate of, rate of profit. That the interplay of tendency and counter tendency that he analyzes in the passages that I've been quoting that specify what these incurable structural co contradictions are. As we've seen, passive revolution actually has to understand that namely fascism and New Deal liberalism are responsive to the crisis created by the falling rate, rate, rate of profit. There are attempts to overcome that, that crisis. So there's a much stronger economic analysis rooted in capital that informs what uh, Crouch's world discussion of um, beginning. This leads me to another uh, famous passage, um, which I think 
reflects Gramsci's knowledge <coughs> that um, there can be an on-pass between the political forces which are struggling to conserve and defend the existing structure and the forces of opposition. And, and this passage has already been cited in this, in this conference in the title of Nino Parkedi's paper. The crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and a new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid sy symptoms appear. Sorry, how much longer do I have? Okay, um, that's, that's time enough. Now, um, Gramsci's passage, that passage by Gramsci has been often quoted to apply to our own condition. But really, there's never been a moment when uh, it's been more appropriate to talk about more with symptoms. When we have the President of the United States going to the United Nations, you know, the domain of peace and international cooperation, and threatening to destroy a country, these are pretty morbid, morbid symptoms. Michael, uh, Michael Heinrich yesterday talked about the rise of the far right, both in Europe and the United States. These are clearly other morbid symptoms. So in the final part of the paper, my presentation, I want to talk a bit about how we can apply this analysis that comes from a combination of Marx and Gramsci, or Marx, the Marx of the falling rate of profit, read by Gramsci, how we can relate that to the, to the, uh, the present. Because it's clear that the forces, political forces that are struggling to conserve and defend the existing structure have been able despite the crisis, to deflect any challenge to the prevailing neoliberal economic policy regime, let alone the capitalism itself. And that what we've seen, whether we talk like Ben Fine about a third phase of neoliberalism, we've seen in the shape of austerity the ruling class trying to solve a crisis at least partly precipitated by neoliberalism through uh, a recharged and radicalised neoliberalism. Near, 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 near. But I think it's and it's very and it's very common to talk in this context about neoliberalism being a passive revolution. But I think it's open to question whether or not that's that's valid because um, passive revolution presupposes a reconstruction not just of bourgeois economic organisation but of bourgeois again it requires a degree of, of consent to to itself. It seems to me that neoliberalism over the whole historical period hasn't been very successful at reconstructing itself. What it's been much more successful is operating at what Gramsci calls the economic corporate level, engineering a series of economic moves driven by financial bubbles, which have allowed a minority of households to prosper through uh, incre an increase in the, the value of their assets their shares or uh, real estate or, 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 or whatever. Um, and um, I also think that this goes back to a much longer argument that capitalism has not been, that neoliberalism has not been very successful in overcoming the economic crisis of the 1970s. It hasn't been able to produce a sustained recovery but to that extent, I agree with Bob and Mina in the arguments that we were having yesterday. So it doesn't seem to me that neoliberalism represents anything resembling a successful version of passive revolution. Do the economic nationalists that now control at least one wing of the Trump administration, um, with a vision that was articulated by Trump again at the United Nations yesterday, do they represent a project of potential passive revolution seems to me that they've been very effective at mobilizing some of the discontent, we all know this now, generated by the experience of neoliberalism and austerity, the stagnation of all of the living standards, so on and so forth. But the idea that you can reconstruct capitalism on a national basis just doesn't seem to be credible in a world of global financial although they've declined since the uh, and a bit of world also global, global supply, supply chains. 
So it seems to me that um, the other side have been able to hang on and prevent uh, any fundamental challenge, even to their existing way of organizing capitalism, not only capitalism itself. They don't have their own uh, coherent project for reconstructing the system in the way in which Gramsci understood the Catholic Revolution and analyzed it in the interwar period. The problem, of course, is that they, you know, in a certain sense, we can say we can identify their weaknesses, but the weaknesses of the radical left are very considerable in, indeed. Um, we could say that we're only at the beginning of the beginning of the development of a hegemonic project of the left. The most effective aspect of corporatism has been its rejection of austerity and a, a reinstatement of the legitimacy of socialism in popular discourse. Its economic program, which is a kind of, you know, slightly timid version of Keynesianism, doesn't represent anything that's adequate to the, to the situation. And any, if we look at the, the, the failures of the radical left elsewhere, and most notably in Greece, we have to, what that requires us to, should I finish? Yeah. Um, is to address, to try and understand my series of failures, why the existing forces were able to defeat it. What was it about their strength but also a series of weaknesses that may be possible. But we also have to address the issues of race and migration, which have been so critical to the ability of the populist right to grow. And the left has to be able to say something that doesn't involve simply um, a, a mixture of timid affirmations of humankind's unity uh, and concessions to the demand but immigration was restricted. These are just a few thoughts that I'm throwing out, which are trying to point towards the way in which the left will have to move if it is to develop a hegemonic project of its own. Liberatory, social, and equal 
technological politics and factors. These barriers can block the development of an effective movement strategy that might match the pace and scale of environmental degradation. As we mark the 150th anniversary of the publication of Marxist Capital, I want to highlight its critical importance for the environmental movement. I also want to emphasize that all activists and scholars, all of us in this room, must take seriously the fact that global ecological crises, from the advance of climate change to the sixth grade extinction, are limiting our possible futures. No matter what other issues concern you, ecological decline is making all other social problems more difficult to solve. This is what the science is telling us. This is what we can see. Um, right here in London, some of you probably know, the air pollution is so bad that almost 10,000 people die each year prematurely because of the bad, the poor quality of the air. It's 10,000 people just in this city. Um, children's lung development is being stunted here because of the levels of air pollution. And globally, the WHO and the UN estimate that 12.6 million deaths each year, 12.6 million, one out of every four deaths each year is due to poor and um, ecological for environmental growth and conditions. This is more than all of the violent conflicts happening in the world combined. Um, just because this is just what's happening to people. It's not to mention the species that are going extinct now at rates that we've never seen except for five other times in history. So we are facing existential threats, and the question of who decides the fate of the earth is inextricably down to the question of who decides the fate of the people, the question of power, and the question of what kind of society we want at the most basic levels. At their core, every struggle is an environmental struggle, and every environmental struggle is a social one, a struggle over who controls and is able to marshal the Earth's resources and to what ends, who controls the land, the places we live and work, the air and the water, who gets to decide how we produce and distribute the world's wealth and the social surplus. Marx understood this, and his insights and capital developed in the work of Socialists are critically important for all of us and for the environmental movement, which is confronting at least five serious and interrelated challenges. These include, first, the ritualized ineffectiveness of international climate negotiations, two, the disorienting onslaught of claims that capital will solve or is solving the socio ecological crises it's produced, three, segregation of the global environmental movement and the apparent reluctance dominant sector to challenge or understand imperialism, white supremacy, patriarchy, the growing violence directed against environmentalists, earth and water protectors, and indigenous activists around the world. The last couple of years have been the most violent on record for environmental activists, um, earth protectors, all of the people engaged in this kind of work. And the fifth biggest threat is Donald Trump. Also, <laughs> I'd also say Theresa May on the Merkel Democratic Party. So, connecting these issues, I draw on Marx's work and contemporary analysis to explain the historical preconditions of the situation we now confront, what every environmentalist needs to know about ecological imperialism, and the necessity of a deep commitment by all of us to transcend deep and realized division of both humanity and nature, which are at the heart of what we call the ecological vision of capitalism. So, Naomi Klein at the Edward Said lecture here in London. In, the, in that lecture, she said, a culture that places so little value on black and brown lives that it is willing to let human beings disappear beneath the waves or set, them on, or set themselves on fire in detention centers will also be willing to let countries where black and brown people really disappear beneath the waves or desiccate in the air. When that happens, theories of human hierarchy that we must take care of our own first will be marshaled to rationalize these monstrous decisions. We are making these rationalizations already, if only implicitly. Eradicating such a monstrous culture points directly to the necessity of tackling head on the imperial system of capital. Such a commitment, I argue, is the first step toward overcoming imperialist politics as usual in order to transform business as usual. In their place, we need a politics that makes the connection in this climate continue between the guns that take black lives on the streets of the United States cities and in police custody and the much larger forces that annihilate so many black lives on air and land and in precarious boats around the world. 
These are exactly the kinds of connections Marxian analysis allows us to make, as I will discuss. So Marx, uh, all of you know this, I had a lot longer presentation. I had to cut in more than half. So if I skip over a lot of things, you're safe from you already know. I apologize that you can ask questions. So Marx is, as I realized after yesterday, almost all of you probably know, um, titled Volume 1 of Capital is simply the commodity. He begins his analysis of the commodity because it is, as he said, the economic cell form of capitalist society, distinguishing the capitalist mode of production from earlier economic forms. For the first time in human history, commodity production is generalized, dominating the economic and social landscape. It doesn't matter, Marx wrote in that first chapter, whether the commodities fulfill a need that arises from the stomach or the imagination, which is a fact excluded by advertising. The value of the commodity realized in exchange and expressed in monetary terms is distinct from its use value and becomes the measure of all things in this system. So, as my colleagues have already discussed, so I'll not belabor, the precondition and the ongoing requirement of this new mode of production was and is the destruction of indigenous industry and the forcible removal from the land of much of the population throughout the world and its concentration in urban cities. This is proceeded through enclosure, eviction, land theft, land grabs, and wars against indigenous people, cultures, and industries. Marx wrote that so-called primitive or primary accumulation is nothing else than the historical process of divorcing the producer from the means of production, and as Raphael said, the means of subsistence history. This task, especially at the global scale via colonialism and imperialism, as we all know, has always been bloody and violent. Marx wrote in a famous passage that in natural history is a notorious fact that conquest, enslavement, robbery, murder, and short force play the greatest part. So, set in motion in the late 14th and early 15th centuries, this process of separating the mass of people from land and introducing capitalist agriculture has had ongoing, enormous um, social, ecological, and uh, social and ecological consequences. In place of the soil and nutrient cycling associated with traditional farming, the displacement of the rural population and the commodification of agriculture meant that increasingly, rather than being returned to the soil as natural fertilizer, essential nutrients were shipped hundreds, even thousands of miles, and ended up as waste polluting the city. Uh, 19th century scientists viewed this disruption of the soil nutrient cycle as a system of robbery, which Marx adopted that um, perspective. And Marx saw this transformation of agriculture under the aegis of capital as an original source of the rift in the metabolism between man and nature, or what we now call the ecological rift of capitalism. With respect to agriculture, he writes, all progress in capitalist agriculture is a progress in the art not only of robbing the worker, but of robbing the soil. All progress in increasing the fertility of the soil for a given time is a progress towards bringing the more lasting source that Capitalist production, therefore, only develops the techniques and the great combination of the social forces and the social process of production by simultaneously undermining the sources of all wealth, the soil, and the worker. So Marx was one of the early articulators, too, of the deformation of science under capitalism and of this idea that capitalism could solve um, the crisis it produced. So he talked about how fertilizer was used mask the soil exhaustion rather than um, actually attempt to restore, um, to, to address the problem in a substantial way. So these issues that uh, Marx wrote about spread globally via the rapacious imperial expansion of capitalist agriculture, the science still often used to facilitate and justify colonial incursions, the extraction of local resources, and the murder, enslavement, and starvation of local people. The ecological rift was generalized in at the global level as the colonial powers sought to compensate for their environmental overdraft at home, um, to feed the growing um, urban market, and develop new sources of raw materials for industry by coming the earth for new inputs, bringing under production new agricultural lands, and seeking new sources of slave or cheap labor. The violent and ecologically destructive long of trade was one exemplary result of this push. The expansion of tropical plantation agriculture and development and export-oriented agriculture in white settler colonies was another. The transformation of 
global agriculture and the more general integration of the global economy involve a racialized division of nature and humanity in quotes from the top down. So in another famous passage, Marx wrote, the discovery of gold and silver in America, the extirpation, enslavement, and achievement in the minds of the indigenous population of that continent, the beginnings of the conquest and plunder of India, and the conversion of Africa into a preserve for hunting and black skin, are all things which characterize the dawn of the era of capitalist production. By the early 1900s, um, within a couple of decades of Marx's death, the colonial powers, their colonies, and their former colonies, as Henry MacDonald wrote, extended over approximately 85% of the Earth's surface. All of this was part of what W. B. Du Bois called the vast quest of the dark world's wealth and toil. It was justified by the religion of capitalist imperialism, um, white supremacy, the gospel Du Bois summarized as whiteness is the ownership of the Earth forever and ever. Today, there's a vast body of research on the way that the development of bioweeds and promotion of racism and gender chauvinism, encouraging, for example, uh, as Alex alluded to, toxic forms of ethno-racial nationalism and masculinity helps divide working people and justify oppression, as well as generate support via the military, participation in the military and police for imperial warfare and repression of liberation. This has been so effective that ideas about race and gender, though entirely socially constructed, obviously, take on a life of their own, with far-reaching, hateful, and deadly consequences. The division of humanity associated with capitalist development along lines of race, ethnicity, nationality, gender, and sexuality has had tremendous consequences, not only for society as a whole, but for our movements. So Marx understood to a great extent the fateful consequences of such divisions in his own time. Among other great opponents and people, England, all of you would know here, colonized Ireland in order to make it the country, Marx wrote, a mere pasture land, which provides the English market with meat and wool at the cheapest possible prices. English elites demeaned and demonized the Irish in order to justify colonization and mistreatment and the maintenance of the wage hierarchy. This divided the workers both within the countries and between them. So Marx wrote to two American socialists a few years after the publication of the Capital that this antagonism the Irish and English workers, he said, is artificially kept alive and intensified by the press, the pulpit, the commentators, in short, by all the means of the disposal of the ruling classes. This antagonism is the secret impotence of the English working class, despite the organization. It is the secret by which the capitalist class maintains its power, and the latter is quite the of this, he wrote. Four whites and blacks in the United States, Marx wrote, were pitted against, against each other in the exact same way. For these reasons, among so many others, Marx saw the defeat of colonialism as a necessary and urgent step toward any serious um, effort of social change. In all of these, um, in all of this, uh, are crucial lessons for today in our country. So colonialism and post-colonial economic conditions, as um, you know, we have some of you work on this and we talked about it yesterday, have led to the vast, often forcible and violent, uncompensated draining of natural wealth from an export of toxic waste to the global south. This has set up a pattern of unequal exchange within the between nations that still with us today and has been extensively analyzed by Marxists from the 19th century until now. This unequal ecological and economic exchange has accumulated in the form of debt owed to global um, a world beliefs to the rest of the world, which is a starting point for thinking about ecological justice, which is a, a widely used term now. Resolving this situation requires tackling head on the imperial system of capital. However, the mainstream environmental movement has been hamstrung by claims that entrepreneurs can solve the ecological crisis by misplaced faith in technology and green or fair trade products and international climate. Without an historical analysis, such as that presented in Capital, to a lot of environmentalists, and I do these workshops with a lot of different um, you know, for a lot of different organizations, and to a lot of them, without that analysis, things like mass displacement, mass displacement, poverty, inequality, and even genocide come to seem like a natural and inevitable feature.
nature of modern society. The general problem is often seen as one of poor communities and countries catching up. I just heard this again on the radio a couple of days ago. But the relationship between the wealth of some areas and the impoverishment of others, or the growth of urban slums and the transformation of the countryside, is rarely discussed. So, looking toward political and economic elites for salvation and often relying on them for funding, significant segments of the movement are cut off from those with the greatest ability and interest in transforming the system the global working class and the dispossessed. This means they're not engaged in the essential yet arduous task of overcoming the social rift imposed by the racialized division of nature and humanity that's at the heart of the ecological rift of capitalism. Mainstream conceptions of environmental justice remain narrow, focused on inequality in terms of outcomes of environmental harms or the need to diversify human leadership, rather than addressing the roots of the social divisions and inequality. These approaches have led too often to many activists, um, as Roxanne Fungard teach wrote, to safely put aside present responsibility for continued harm done by this past in questions of reparations, restitution, and reordering society. But leaving aside such questions or minimizing them precludes the kind of the deeper solidarity across social divisions that we need, we need critically right now in all of our movements. Capital, in other words, Marx lays the groundwork for the critical analysis required to build a, a movement for socio-ecological revolution. However, the analysis has to move forward in our present day, and there's incredible work being done that points, helps point the way forward for the environmental movement and all of us seeking to go beyond capital. And since this is the topic of our panel, panel I wanted to end by highlighting one of the most astute and inspiring examples I've seen recently of this kind of work in the Itself. There's a lot of work by what eco socialists, eco Marxists, and so on. But here's an example um, from the movement um, of, of where I think this analysis is going, um, one of the best places in this analysis as well. So, just after the Paris Agreement was reached, the It Takes Root delegation to the Climate Summit published a report titled We Are Mother Earth's Red Line Frontline Communities Lead the Climate Justice Fight Beyond the Paris Agreement. Online. The It Takes Roots website explains that It Takes Roots to Grow the Resistance is a multiracial effort led by women and gender oppressed people of color and indigenous people on the front lines of racial, housing, and climate justice across the country. Their report, um, I will read you a quote from the report. They, um, to me, present one of the most sophisticated. Okay. The, the report to me presents one of the most sophisticated and relevant analysis to date of the conflict and choice that must be made between holding the red line of collective survival and satisfying the bottom line of corporate financial issues. The authors write, a red line is a point of no return, or a limit past which safety can no longer be guaranteed. Frontline communities are not only waging fights to stop extraction of the source, we are holding the uncompromising line of collective survival and demonstrating real solutions that are within our grasp. We join the call for system change, not climate change, which comes out of the eco-socialist movement, because we know that the fundamental driving force behind the climate crisis is capitalism, the very nature of the extractive economy as a whole. Climate justice is not only about the environment, it's tied to peace, jobs, housing, poverty, migration, food sovereignty, gender equality, and access to health care. System change requires fundamental respect for human rights, particularly the rights of indigenous people, as well as the rights of future generations of Mother Earth. Under the conditions we're facing, to me, um, this is this is the future of the analysis and the future of struggle. Um, this is the direction that we should go. I feel like if we're to have a future at all. Um, thank you. Would it be better if I that? Uh, let me stop and see how it goes. 
So thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. So to uh, distinguish uh, Marx's colleagues and to, to attempt to carry on uh, the tradition of Marxian scholarship and research and activism to overthrow capitalism. And as uh, you can see from the, the title slide, my, my presentation is about uh, the real profit uh, and the future of capitalism. Uh, it will be almost entirely about U.S. capitalism um, and the U.S. economy, but in the end I'll have a few words uh, to say about China. Um, and I, I imagine it's uh, well known in this audience that uh, the rate of profit uh, in the U.S. economy declined significantly in the early post-war period through the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, uh, approximately 50% decline, uh, and, and this uh, significant uh, decline is shown by uh, 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 everybody's estimates of the rate of profit. At different levels, perhaps, but the overall trend uh, of the different sets of estimates uh, uh, is very similar. And there's also uh, uh, perhaps somewhat less of a consensus, but close to a consensus that the rate of profit since the early 80s has recovered only slightly, uh, and partially uh, the 50% uh, uh, prior decline in the early post -war. So my focus will be on the causes of this very significant decline uh, of the rate of profit, uh, and what, uh, according to Marxist theory, the causes according to Marxist theory, and what Marxist theory implies uh, about the necessary conditions for a more complete recovery uh, of the rate of profit, which in turn uh, is a precondition uh, for a recovery in general of the U.S. economy and perhaps the uh, possibility of uh, a return to the more prosperous conditions uh, of the early post-war period. And a key point that I will emphasize uh, is Marx's distinction between productive labor and unproductive labor, uh, which I think has not received uh, the attention it deserves uh, and requires uh, in a Marxian analysis uh, of the rate of profit. Uh, I think Marx's focus and emphasis on the rate of profit uh, is uh, one of the important reasons why Marxist theory is still very relevant uh, uh, to us today uh, in the 21st century. And let me just say, in striking contrast, uh, mainstream economics, mainstream macroeconomics, has no theory of the rate of profit. For the Google economists are aware of this. Right? That the rate of profit, profit and the rate of profit is not even a variable in the theory. Right? It's just absent. Uh, I was shocked myself when I first learned this blending omission uh, as a young graduate student. Uh, I had studied Marx's theory prior to studying economics, so this, this omission was especially obvious and, and, uh, and, and shocking to me. And it's still shocking today, I think, that not me so much, but that mainstream macroeconomics uh, uh, still has no uh, attempt to integrate profits and great profit into this theory. Uh, and then it tends to be the theory of capitalism without taking the rate of profit into account. Uh, if anything, uh, mainstream macroeconomics these days is going in the opposite direction uh, with uh, currently popular models. Uh, uh, like the, the DSGE, that having stochastic general equilibrium models, but which oftentimes do not even have capitalist firms uh, in the theory, to say nothing of profit, uh, and instead attempt to derive macroeconomic conclusions uh, in some way from the utility maximization of individual consumers. Uh, this seems to be uh, uh, a non starter uh, uh, analysis. Uh, and other heterodox uh, theories, the Keynesian 
theories uh, of the rate of profit, one that, uh, uh, that, that the amount of profit depends on the investor, because it's investment rather than the other way around, one very many, uh, and the other kind of Kolesky theory of the profit, that, that profit depends on the degree of monopoly. Uh, I think these are not, these theories are not much better. Uh, uh, and, and, and clearly, clearly in the post-war period, uh, the rate of profit declined in spite of an increase uh, in the degree of uh, monopoly uh, in the U.S. economy and, and, and most of the time. So if you want to understand uh, the rate of profit today and its key role in recent decades and the current crisis, uh, uh, the, the, the Marxian theory is, is clearly the best theory uh, uh, available, and uh, it's, it's almost uh, no competition. If you want to understand the rate of profit, we have to go Okay, uh, uh, so uh, first just to review some of the, the basics uh, of, uh, of, of Marxist theory of the rate of profit, which I imagine everybody in this room is familiar with. Uh, so, uh, uh, to start with, uh, 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 Marx's own analysis of all great profit in value of free capital, uh, which, as you know, uh, is in terms of productive capital only. Right? Uh, and so, uh, uh, the, the, the rate of profit is the, uh, the, the, the familiar ratio between the amount of surplus value. Uh, divided by the stock of capital invested, um, uh, where the surplus value in the numerator is the, the annual amount uh, of surplus value, uh, what we call a flow variable, and the C and V in the denominator are the stocks of capital invested uh, at the beginning of the year. Right? So the, the V in the denominator. Uh, uh, of the, the, the definition of the rate of profit is actually uh, fairly small uh, because uh, capitalists do not advance. Capitalists do not pay workers before they work. Uh, capitalists pay workers only after they work and produce, and oftentimes the products have been sold. So the, the stock of advanced capital in the denominator here uh, at least does a simplification uh, can be uh, ignored and uh, simplify, uh, I define uh, Marx's rate of profit as the ratio of the annual surplus value to the stock of constant <coughs> right? Then we divide uh, both numerator and denominator by the annual flow of variable capital, right? And we do that because variable capital is the source of surplus value. Right? So we want to relate all of the other variables to the source of surplus value. And so what uh, results in is uh, uh, the, uh, a ratio of ratios. Right? The, the rate of profit is has the S over B, which is the rate of surplus value in the numerator, and uh, C over B, uh, the composition of capital in the denominator. Right? So uh, this uh, uh, means that uh, the, the, the rate of profit varies, of course, directly with the rate of surplus value and inversely with the composition of capital. Then Marx's theory of the rate of profit analyzes the effects of technological change on the two determinants of the rate of profit and then on uh, the, the net effects of on the, the rate of profit itself. And, uh, and, and technological change uh, this inherent dynamic of capitalist of economies uh, increases both the rate of surplus value and the composition of capital. Right? Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, not sure it's the, the best way to describe this as tendencies and counter tendencies because, in fact, they are both uh, effects of the same process uh, labor saving. Uh, technological change. So in any case, uh, as you know, Marx argued that the increase in the composition of capital would, in general, increase faster uh, than the increase in the rate of surplus value so that the, the, the net effect on the rate of profit would be negative. So this theory implies, right, 
that there are two ways where the rate of profit can be increased. And after a period of decline, where are ways in which the rate of profit could be restored. Right? One is an increase in the rate of surplus value, uh, but since, uh, or a further increase in the rate of surplus value, one should say, but since uh, 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 the decline in the rate of profit was not caused by a decline in the rate of surplus value, it's unlikely that just increasing the rate of surplus value further it would fully restore the rate of profit uh, in most circumstances. So then the and I think really important conclusion that you maybe with, I imagine, uh, is that in order to fully restore uh, the rate of profit and make possible another period of expansion in relative prosperity of, of, of capitalist economies is necessary to reduce the composition of capital, right? Which in actual capitalist economies has been accomplished over and over again by widespread bankruptcies, uh, the devaluation of capital uh, uh, that uh, restores the rate of profit and enables uh, another upswing. Okay, so that's the classic. Marxist theory of the falling rate of profit. However, it's just for productive capital. And if you want to analyze capitalism at a more concrete level, right, uh, then we need an analysis of the rate of profit on the table, right, including both productive and unproductive capital. Right? And thus, uh, we need to make the important distinction between productive and unproductive capital, and fundamentally, between productive and unproductive labor. Okay, so uh, I assume you're more or less familiar with uh, these, these basic definitions as well. Productive labor is labor in capitalist production that produces commodities and value and surplus value. Uh, unproductive labor, and I mean here unproductive labor employed by capital, because that's what our cost, direct cost to capital. Uh, and so I'm setting aside the other category of unproductive labor employed outside of capital. By, by, the, by the government, by the house, perhaps. Uh, so uh, there are two main types of unproductive labor employed by capital, uh, what uh, Marx and others have called, uh, in, in the first place, circulation labor, labor involved in buying and selling in one way or another, uh, retail, wholesale, retail trade, uh, finance, uh, accounting, uh, etc. basic theoretical, uh, assumption is that no value is produced in exchange. So even though these uh, uh, workers uh, in, 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 engaged in exchange are entirely necessary uh, in the capitalist economy, unproductive does not mean unnecessary, uh, uh, to the contrary, but their function uh, is not productive of additional value and surplus value. So that uh, productive and unproductive in, in capitalism uh, does not mean necessary or unnecessary, it means produces surplus value or not. Right? And so then the other category of unproductive labor is what's been called supervisory labor or management labor from uh, supervisors, middle management, and uh, up. Uh, and, and this labor in general is not uh, technically required for production, but is instead necessary because of the antagonistic relation between capitalists and, and workers, and therefore is necessary to control uh, the labor of workers. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, Possible 
causes of the decline in what I call the capitalist rate of profit, not only in the conventional increase in the composition of capital, but also uh, uh, the, the increase in the relative proportions of unproductive labor. Okay? And so then that means that there are also different possible ways, additional possible ways of restoring the rate of profit in addition to the devaluation of capital, uh, the relative reduction of unproductive Okay, so what's next uh, are our some estimates. Uh, uh, I divided the post-war economy into two periods, the period of decline and then the period of partial restoration of the rate of profit. Uh, and you can see in the right-hand column uh, the rate of profit. The current, these, are, these are estimates from my 1992 book uh, for, the, for the first period. Uh, it was cut exactly in half uh, uh, from 22% to 11%. And you can see uh, the, the, the trends of the determinants of uh, the rate of profit, an increase in the rate of surplus value, which by itself would have resulted in an increase in the rate of uh, profit, right? But that was offset by uh, an increase in the relative uh, proportion of unproductive wages and also by uh, the increase in the, the, the kind of classical cause of the increase in the composition of capital. Okay, so I haven't really worked on these estimates to, to update uh, myself uh, since my 1992 book. So for the, the recent period to get some idea of what the recent trends uh, have been, I am using uh, the, the very similar estimates of Simon Bowman, who's many of you know and has uh, written several papers uh, on this subject in recent years. So the next uh, period, the period of recovery, you can see, according to his estimates, uh, uh, only a small partial increase uh, from 10% uh, to 14%, uh, still less than half of the recovery of the prior decline. Uh, and that uh, uh, the, the, what's really quite striking to think about these estimates is the rate of surplus value itself increased very significantly during this period, from roughly two to roughly three. You can see, so that by itself would have almost entirely restored the rate of profit. But that has been offset by uh, a continuing increase in the, the ratio of uh, unproductive wages to the wages of productive labor, and also, to a lesser extent, by a continued increase uh, in the composition of capital. Right? So we can see that the ratio of EP, the, 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 the ratio of unproductive wages to the wages of productive labor, uh, was both the primary cause of the decline in the early post-war period and the main reason for the only partial recovery. So uh, this kind of uh, highlights uh, a, a crucial barrier in uh, Marxian crisis. Uh, what I would like to have done if I had more time, well, I, I will uh, I go through this as quickly as I can. The, the U over V can be decomposed into the products of the number of workers and the average wage per worker, both for productive and unproductive labor. And then you put those together in the ratio, rearrange a little bit, and the, the ratio of U to V can then be understood as the, the product of two ratios, the ratio of relative number of workers and the relative average wages. Okay? Uh, and so uh, those are two possible causes of the increase in the overall wage, total wages to uh, uh, productive labor. And in the early post-war period, uh, the increase in U over V was due almost entirely to the ratio of relative number of workers. The relative average wage uh, stayed roughly constant for the entire post-war period. Uh, but in the, uh, the, the second period, period of partial recovery uh, is very different. And, and this, this comes from uh, Mogu's estimates and was something of a surprise to me. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, these are uh, valid estimates. So this is a graph of Simon. Uh, the uh, bottom graph is, is the relative number of workers, uh, where it's actually the share of unproductive labor to total labor, both productive and unproductive. Trend is the same. So you can see a small increase in the relative number of workers, but a very big increase in the total uh, wages of unproductive labor to total uh, to total wages. Uh, so that's a, that's a striking difference uh, 
uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the, the second period, and we can go even further than that. Uh, uh, we can, this is what Simon does, is to break down unproductive labor into what he calls the working class unproductive labor and the capitalist class unproductive labor. You can see the definitions there. The working class are at the bottom, the non-supervisory, mainly in trade and finance and, and uh, accounting and so forth. And then the supervisors and managers and up, uh, 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 he calls the capitalist class unproductive labor. So we have uh, and, and so you can have the same kind of graphs for both of these two groups. This is the graph for under unproductive working class, right? Uh, and uh, so you have um, uh, the, the relative number of workers, the red line, has been roughly constant and a slight increase in uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, proportion of the share of uh, the wages of the working class unproductive labor to total wages. Okay, just a couple more graphs. So this is this is maybe the, the main uh, graph, and the main conclusion that for the capitalist class, unproductive labor, their relative wages increase much more, uh, and that that seems to be the main reason for the uh, the limited recovery uh, in the rate of profit. Right. So one can ask. Uh, let's go. Uh, so that just uh, stays the same thing. I'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, so it, it does raise a question: How do we want to interpret these uh, top management salaries, right? They're, that are cost to firms, right? But are clearly income uh, to capitalists and, and CEOs. Uh, Simon argues that you know, he, he defines what he calls the class rate of profit, which includes not only the limited profit that I, you know, the actual profit is as uh, accounted by capital and uh, the, uh, the the wages of the, the salaries of the, the capitalist class under the labor, and you can see that the, the class rate of profit is almost entirely restored uh, uh, in the because of this huge increase in the relative average salary. But I don't think that's correct. I don't think that's the, the, the appropriate rate of profit in terms of analyzing the effects on accumulation and the general economy. The, the money that is paid out to top managers and so forth is not available to the firms for accumulation, and it's also not available to pay debts uh, if, if the company uh, was, was uh, in. Yeah, in, in, in trouble. Okay, so uh, the likely future trends, uh, uh, again, the, the main conclusion in the end comes back to the same that uh, 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 it's unlikely that the ratio of unproductive labor to variable capital is going to decline. Uh, perhaps, I mean, things are happening like the automation of retail trade, right? Uh, the automation of surveillance. Uh, of workers is also uh, reducing the need for the number of unproductive labor. So that could happen to some extent, but ultimately it's going to take uh, another significant evaluation of capital, another much more serious depression uh, in, uh, in order to fully restore the rate of profit. I need to say, uh, it, it was uh, mentioned that uh, 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 Mio Kalkadi's paper yesterday said that, you know, if we had such a devaluation, then capitalism would come out of it even stronger than before. That's hard for me to imagine. Uh, it, it's really hard for me to imagine uh, another deep depression uh, in capitalism recovery. Okay. I, 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 I guess, I mean, that's always possible, but uh, I think that, I mean, already the tensions in the world are so great uh, that it, it, it seems to me that that will just increase not only economic trade wars, but, but military uh, conflicts. And that uh, along with uh, the ecological uh, looming disasters, uh, I think uh, the, uh, another depression would lead to uh, the end of not only capitalism, but human uh, economy. And so I think it's increasingly necessary for, for us to uh, 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 stroke off the shackles of this profit motive and 
profit uh, maximizing economy and uh, organize and generate uh, a movement toward uh, an economy which uh, uh, takes people's needs first. I wanted to say something about China. Yeah, okay. you uh, mm -hmm. So please ask me about it. <laughs> <laughs> So, 
that's uh, so the idea uh, of the of, of this uh, working progress paper is to, to search for the changes uh, that Marx uh, had in his life and the, the, the different subjects that he, he differed and how uh, he followed uh, using the word from today technological revolutions that he was witness, witness uh, and also emerging uh, technology. So we begin so move uh, page uh, three is uh, we begin looking uh, a little just one Yes, we begin in 1850, where in London, where in a club somewhere. This is uh, something that Wilhelm Liebknecht told us in his memories that he met for the first time Marx uh, somewhere. And what Marx was talking uh, to him, that's the, what, okay, his memories, he wrote that in, in the end of the uh, 19th century. But read with me. Uh, Kingston, King, Kingston <coughs> had revolutionized the world, but something more revolutionary was done. The electric spark. And Libre Net tells us. Now Marx, all flushed and excited, told me that during the last day, the model of the electric engine drawing a rainbow train was on exhibition in Richard Street. Point. That's the. So, uh, it's, it's Marx first. I think that this is important because Marx probably had an insight or a clear vision that steam was not the last uh, technology of the world. Something was coming and would overcome uh, the age of steam. Okay. But Marx, go to figure one, uh, is uh, important. But Marx, what, what was Marx really at that time? So, the, his notebooks of the 50s. He was prepared to write uh, the book that we are celebrating now. He was reading uh, some of the like, books, okay? Physics, Mathematics, Technology, uh, and Andrew Kuhl. Kuhl, that together with Spahari, helped Marx to understand the specificities of machinery. That, so we all can read in, in the, that chapter about machines, uh, machinery, that what is the system of machines, transmission to uh, engineering and so on. Where did Marx learn that? From who and from Papa. Huh? So uh, I'm talking about this because this has implication for the conclusion of uh, this presentation. So next uh, figure uh, 385. So we go to the uh, notebook, this notebook, okay, you can read uh, that in, in Marx's handwriting. That is, uh, <laughs> 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 okay, okay. Uh, but someone did the, the work for us. <laughs> so, uh, thanks to Michael Irish, I have this Miller. Uh, uh, who did the deciphering, and we know that Marx had read something about uh, in, the, in 1850 about a locomotive, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, steam uh, locomotive that linked uh, Liverpool to Manchester in October 1889. So that's very important because for uh, okay, I will cut and. Uh, if, if you read a uh, paper from Carlotta Perez, a new Schubertian economist that organized all the technological revolutions uh, since the Industrial Revolution, she would mention this locomotive as uh, a key technology for the second uh, age of uh, technological age in capitalism, uh, the age of steam. So Max had read about that in the 50s. Uh, but Marx had also gave back uh, uh, lots of things uh, to his viewer, uh, uh, Dalaj, and so he had, uh, uh, he was preparing to write uh, 
gap. So we go to the next section. The next section we we page. No, no, take the five. Just the fact of session two. Yes, this, 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 this. So we go to uh, 18, 6, 7. What I would like to take from Kafka? Just uh, three things. First, uh, he uses your and Robaji to understand the, let's say, the scientific and technological basis of machine. One. Two, he puts, uh, 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 he describes the industrial revolution anticipating uh, what uh, could be uh, today an explanation of what is a technological revolution. If everybody remembers uh, that, uh, that quotation, page six, uh, where well, Marx explained. Uh, how something that happened in one place, the mechanization of textiles, how these, uh, using today's words, has impacts uh, forward linkage, backward linkage, and so the revolution in one point spreads throughout the whole economy. Uh, okay, so the transformation of the model of production uh, impacts the, 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 the calls for, for the integration of the gene calls for changes in agriculture, calls for change in communication, transport in the end. Uh, we remember that we, we will see the production of machines by means of machines. So uh, this is a, uh, the idea of ID, a technological revolution that can apply again. Think about electricity, think about uh, digital uh, technology and so on and so forth. So it's a, a, a clever and anticipating idea about Technological evolution. Then, uh, page uh, seven, please. Uh, the other important point that I would like to, to collect from from Kaplan here is the impact of the industrial revolution over the world. So the idea is that uh, uh, much of the very clear. If we go, everybody knows that India and China were two very powerful uh, manufacturing. Uh, uh, <coughs> when I was here, uh, Alex recommended me to read the book from John Darwin. And Darwin says that we have 6% of global manufacturing exports in the 18th century produced in India, the textile workshop of the world. 18th What did the Industrial Revolution do for this? Marx would say it decimated the the silent factory in India, and Max goes on, transform India in a country that produces agricultural products for uh, England. That, that's the, so we have the idea, uh, we have then the beginning with the next part, please. Uh, so this I can read and highlight. Uh, Max says, uh, the industrial revolution, uh, at the center, converts one part of the globe in a chiefly agricultural field of production for supplying the other part. It remains a preeminently industrial field. So, point that there is there. We see now the origin of the division between a center and a region. Industrial uh, revolution and uh, this, this process. Okay. Uh, and Max will write, uh, there is now a new and international division of labor. So we have a technological revolution at one point and the transformation of international division of labor. A new and international. Cut out pages, both, and so on. So we move further. Uh, uh, then, uh, we have six, seven, twelve years after there is a letter from uh, Max to Daniel. Uh, by the way, this letter is uh, both remembered on the other day that Max was saying, I will not complete the second volume of Das, of das Kapital until this crisis uh, resolves. So that's the, uh, okay, 
But now I, 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 I use this lab for another reason. But a very uh, insightful lab about railways and the uh, impact of railways in, in the economy and so forth. Railways, as we have seen, could be a, uh, the opening uh, big bang, to use our academic words, of a second technological revolution. It, in, it was revolutionizing uh, the whole world, but it was also revolutionizing uh, Britain, the financial system. And so our group, our research group, we have uh, uh, done some work with the notebooks, uh, Max notebooks of the crisis of 66, and we can see how Max was studying railways a lot, railways finance, uh, financial innovation, I would say, payments, uh, uh, the ventures, and of course, one of the causes of the, the breakdown of uh, the problems of the, the stock exchange and so on, well, the problems were related to uh, railway fines and so things. As uh, in, in 2000, Wall Street had problems with the uh, leading technology, the dot com, uh, oh, well, and so on. In 1866, the railways, the, the ones that were very cool. So, but then we have a, a, a group, uh, someone, uh, again, John Darwin would say a railway mania that were in Britain, and this is not a national uh, phenomenon, but also international, foreign investments, railway growing everywhere. And Max was very, he was following this. So that's the, in his letter to the also. Uh, okay. Uh, he, 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 he mentions railways as, uh, sorry for the French, Corona de Lefe, uh, all that uh, in a way different from capital. And uh, uh, then he uses, it's a kind of new starting point for stock exchange, the relationship with spread system and so on. Uh, uh, and then, uh, uh, I, I would highlight this, a, a new uh, starting point. Uh, uh, it accelerates the population. So what it, and this match is very important for, uh, the, for the relationship with the, the, the rest of the world. Because it will uh, show uh, a yeah. Much will show how they spread of the, the, the wave waves. They were important for, uh, for uh, developing uh, uh, a capitalist infrastructure in countries that had very little capitalist development within them. So uh, he comments that as the railways uh, uh, arise, uh, uh, goals uh, for lots of new regions, uh, it will change the international division of labor, turning very specific locations uh, to produce, then I quote, uh, uh, they, they are, uh, as goes, they, they are products, fruit, fish, uh, and so on. They produce that according to its greater or minor suitableness for exportation. So the railways go there and change local communities to adapt so that the, the international division of labor is becoming more refined given this very uh, important transformation. Okay, then, uh, point four, we go to the to Max in uh, the period between 79 and 82. And now I will use uh, Theodor Shanin's work. It's very important because Theodor Shanin would suggest that the late Marx is very important. Different. My co-author, Joan Antonio, would even say that there is another Marx, because Marx now, after the white, because the broad international, because of the defeat of the Paris Commune, because of lots of he learns, he looks for the global world and understands that capital was not enough. So we have lots of studies, investigations to do. And uh, so he began to 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 investigate uh, lots of things, and in this event, page 12, there is a 
very important letter to Vera Zazulich, where Marx discusses, I would say, the specificities of the beginnings of the development of capitalism in Russia, the, 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 the future of the primitive communities, uh, and so on. But he is discussing how, uh, so how capitalism would develop using hot house conditions, how the state will intervene uh, to support the development of railways, uh, steel industry, and so on. 80s, yeah, early 80s. Uh, so uh, I would say that Marx was sensing two things here. First, that you should, uh, I would say, that the periphery is not a, 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 a homogeneous uh, set. Heterogeneity was very important to understand the periphery of capitalism. Because, okay, he writes to that, he writes to that as a Russia was not uh, colonized by a foreign country, either was, so that's different between who was colonized who was not. Then we begin to China, there are particularities, and so a, a good differentiation, Shani uh, would say, Marx accept a plurality of roads of possible developments of capitalism throughout the world. So it's, it's very uh, different from something very homogeneous that would make the world of people. Yeah. So uh, in this letter, Marx would uh, mention also that uh, there is industry in the periphery. So remember, in capital, uh, 20 years earlier, he says there is a center, industry, a periphery, agriculture. Now, he says, okay, Russia is a peripheral country, yeah, we was discussing that, and there is already industry there, with conditions very different from the conditions uh, that uh, he knew, yeah, from the England and even from, from West Europe in the US. So, uh, for complex, uh, complexification of the agriculture. And now, going to my last uh, session, uh, it's a, a big point, <laughs> but I would say one phrase, you understand. So, uh, what was my guess? So, we go to the uh, B156. Uh, uh, what Marx was reading in 1882. This book, look, let's go to the contents, yes, please. Uh, Last is equal there, electricity. So the book talks about uh, uh, lightning, a very up to date book, but we have seen a little. Uh, and even uh, what did this book talks about? Talk about uh, Siemens, Thomas Edison, uh, Dupré. Uh, so people that were scientifically revolutionizing uh, okay, uh, technology. Yeah. Uh, okay, so so this is why he was still reading this book on, on electricity. Our uh, guess is that he was trying to he was trying to, to, to understand a technology that was only emerging at, at his time. Because the key uh, the key event for this uh, technology would be according to Carlos Alves, in the future people, would be the creation by Thomas Edison of that uh, uh, the, the scheme of uh, production and distribution of electricity in New York. 1885, so before uh, we, we are in 1882. So Marx was trying to understand something that was working, using everything that was a new thing. And I would say that we have now mega uh, volume 4.31, where they put together these uh, excerpts from Marx uh, regarding electricity with excerpts regarding chemistry. Chemistry organic, chemistry, and so on. And I will ask you, what were the basic industries for the third technological revolution? Certainly, still, you would say, and uh, electricity and chemistry. Yeah? Uh, so, 
much of structure that is still not threatened in this, uh, in this uh, field. Uh, and therefore, concluding, we can uh, see that uh, the, the idea is uh, every time that we have uh, a revolution in technology, this has, according to what we can read by this, uh, following these notebooks of Marx, we can see that Marx try to understand the implications for the rest of the world. And this is very important uh, because, just to conclude in the last, uh, we know that now, uh, I would say, a peripheral country, China, uh, quite peripheral, because his, uh, her GDP per capita now is compiled, I think that the China overtook the Brazilian uh, GDP per capita last year. So China is under the, 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 the who knows if China will overcome the so-called middle income trap. This is a, but so it's very strange because this world, because a very fair country, China, is then giving, if we study uh, using the data from the GDP, uh, PPP, uh, purchasing power party, China is the richest country since uh, many years ago. So, uh, to understand mm -hmm. the represent all these changes is very important and I think we have, can have lots of light uh, uh, going for not only what Marx published, but what Marx used to organize his studies. It was more complex, more interesting, and more, I would say, Open and more evolutionary than uh, if we meet only a Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Eduardo. I'm sorry that I had to hurry you along, but partly because of the disrupted start to the, the, the morning session, we need to be sure that there's time for discussion. And I can already see. Several hands up, so I think Dr. Jane, you would have the first one. Okay, thank you. I'd just like to raise some questions and continue the story about China and also about um, new divisions of labour. The first one is to say that, of course, we have to acknowledge the growth of China, its economic power, its political aspirations through the, 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 um, the Belt and Road Initiative. But I think also we have to understand its internal contradictions. And although Alex talked about the state having control over state banks, you know, China has had its own problems in terms of finance and a huge bailout of 2008, um, unleashed enormous spending, enormous speculation. And if you go to China, you can travel five miles and see a forest of empty flat. So that is a real instability, I think, in, in the system. Secondly, China has you know, a massive problem of overaccumulation. It does not have enough wages and, and spending within its own economy in order to buy what it produces. Therefore, it has to export, it has to try and escape being low down the value chain of large companies, which has implications for all sorts of um, geopolitical dimensions. So perhaps um, the panel would like to comment on that. Um, I'd just like to say something about Eduardo's presentation because new divisions of labour in the global economy are very important, um, as Beverly Silva has illustrated in her brilliant book. What it shows is where there are, you know, the changing composition of the working class and how there are new sites of um, new sites of conflict. But I think we also need to understand that new divisions of labour, Marx didn't just make the observation that they were driven by sort of waves of technology, but they're also very dynamic in terms of changing opportunities for profit. And again, we can look at China. 
and China is a lot of one-way story, that um, the fourfold increase in wages mean that firms are making much lower average rates of profit. And two years ago, I, I looked at 20 firms in the coastal part of China, and they were all adopting technology, they were shifting to other parts of China, or they were shifting production to um, shifting production outside of China to places like Bangladesh. Um, the same is true, I won't go into this, but we will tell you to in, 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 in Europe. Okay, so, so enough. But I think we have to understand new divisions of labour, not as just being driven by technology, but also as opportunities for different opportunities for profit. Okay, thanks, uh, Janine. Uh, hi, my question is uh, mainly to Eduardo, but I think it overlaps with um, also Hannah and me, right? And Alex, maybe I should speak. Yes. Uh, well, first, I'd like to know if Eduardo is aware of Benedito Rodriguez de Moraes' Neto's work on uh, machinery and how he interprets. Uh, machinery from Marx, which I think is the most precise I have because he goes back to Uri and uh, Babbage and provides a criticism of Brinkman as well. But I, I, I won't uh, talk about it because my uh, question is more on the uh, international division of labor, and I agree with you that uh, Marx already in volume one, talking about production, uh, uh, provides. The, the framework for understanding this division between the, in the, uh, some countries that are the, the industrial field for capital and uh, another, the agricultural field in uh, other countries. But uh, even though a machinery can be uh, adopted in uh, the periphery of capitalism, there was never a production of machinery by means of machinery in the, the, the third world countries, which I think is quite uh, relevant. Uh, I would like just to point out that in volume three, he also gets back to the role of the value of constant capital uh, and the effects of uh, uh, a decrease in the value of constant capital in, in volume three and its effects on the rate of profit. And he emphasizes the role of raw materials, not only uh, the value of machinery, which I think. Uh, is uh, very relevant for this international division of labor. And uh, my question uh, is how we should understand through this differentiation in, in production and different organic <coughs> compositions in different countries the transfers of value uh, between uh, countries because uh, we hear a lot that uh, it's through the, uh, the formation of uh, an average rate of profit that those transfers Occur, but usually the competition between the it's not within the same branches. Uh, of course, the, the third world countries uh, they uh, don't produce all the same products with the the core capitalist countries. So how can this in terms of value uh, occur? Thanks, uh, Raquel. Thank you. I first just want to say that I think you is. Uh, this unproductive supervisor's uh, wages, which are not wages, but profit, uh, how they appear in statistics of the company as wages or as profit? And the taxation is also different. So, for example, in Volkswagen and in the automobile industry, uh, they are represented and they have votes in workers' commission. Uh, in workers' commissions. And uh, my second question is about statistics. Because I, I also think they're really important and thank you for doing this. But my, I've been working in three or four sectors in the last uh, well, some years. And when I go to the factories or to the workplaces, I discover that statistics are one thing and reality is another one. So we are almost in the same place as Soviet Union in the 70s or something like that. Because they cheat all the time, those workers and bosses. So, for example, I've, I've done a study on doctor, doctors in the National Health Services, and 10 years ago, what would be a surgery, a women's surgery? I don't know the name English, where you take uh, all your fertile reproductive system. 
this would be one circuit. And nowadays it's seven. So each part of it, it's the same surgery, but statistically it counts at seven. So the doctors, when they are working in the court, they go to work and they leave the work before, because they finish the shift before. But statistically it appears as they have been working a uh, regular shift. Uh, I mean, even we, the teachers, have been seeing how the marks of our students have been inflated in the last two decades. And then the bosses complain that the students are not well trained. But of course, they don't complain of the privatization of the university <coughs> system that led to this. So I think another important statistic is in the automobile industry. I see that workers, real workers that I study, sign a paper saying they were in training, and this is paid by Social Security, and they never, they never been there. So, uh, this is my, my last question is for Alex, sorry to take so long, it's about welfare straight is a transition uh, uh, demand or not. So, I would say that in the South, in 1945 was a way of counter-revolution, at least in my view. But nowadays, I see there's a revolutionary demand that we live in southern countries. I, I don't see it as it is possible to keep the welfare state and the regime nowadays in southern countries. But that, it's not clear for me in northern central countries or poor countries. So the question is, there is real space for reforms in central capitalist countries if they are really threatened or not. There is no Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, two points. Firstly, I'm interested. Uh, I remain deeply sceptical of the use of national income accounts for calculating rates of profit. But if you're going to use them, I do acknowledge that it's difficult not to use them given that everybody else is using them. Uh, Simon Rowan's got to be right on including the salaries of top managers and so on within that general rate of profit. The question of the effects of that, or the linkages of that, to the gap which we can see between profit rates and investment rates is an interesting one. It's a more concrete question, if you like. To find, you know, it's an argument that needs to be taken at a different level of analysis. So I think I stand this on that question. More generally, in the light of the superb paper, I think, on, by sorry, Edward. 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 Um, well, I can't help thinking that we lack, and this is an appeal to anybody in the room, we lack still a serious Marxist analysis of the impact of the information technology revolution over the last 30 years. We don't have it, certainly in the Anglo-Saxon world, and there may be material in Brazil or wherever. Um, what we have instead is a debate dominated, unfortunately, by the Italian school of Cognitive capitalism, which I think David Harvey quite rightly had a go at last night. <coughs> um, and we have some interesting, very interesting, and I think very suggestive comments by Paul Mason in his book on post capitalism about the way in which the marginal cost of the cost of reproduction of uh, software, etc., has been due to zero, which <coughs> needs to be incorporated, I think, into that analysis. But that is merely a set of almost throwaway suggestive remarks. We was impressionistic, but nevertheless very suggestive. And I do think that work should not be dismissed uh, by the like people who respond to that, especially Alex, who has this. Okay. Uh, yeah. You. Yeah. yeah. I feel that in the last few days and also in this last session, a sort of modern tension that I would like to make explicit and question that there are people. Yeah, is one is what is the economy that we are dealing with? Is it a world, one single world economy or is it a collection of national economies? And I don't see the different representations having the same perspective on that. Um, so, for instance, I find these presentations on the rates of profit falling in the US and in Britain yesterday with Michael Roberts extremely interesting and extremely sort of convincing. And, but I wonder what is the use of that, because to me the question surely is what is the falling rate of profit at the level of the level of the world economy. We heard yesterday about different national capitalist economies, and I'm not really 
convinced by that principle because it seems that there's one more company, a world economy, which has different um, components of one more world with different flavor. And it seems the question to me about whether there are separate national capitals or whether there's a world capitalist class is a very key question at the moment in terms of where the geopolitics are going and the tensions that will develop. So I thought it would be to address that. Any questions or comments? Yeah. There was just a question to Hannah, really. Um, you spoke very well about um, Mark's very important concept of the metabolic grid, which has been taken up by people like John Bernie Foster. And, and, <coughs> but I was going to talk to you to comment on whether there's other bits of capital that might also be useful. I was thinking, particularly of the way that some big kind of Marxists have used the idea of a formal subsumption and real subsumption and talk about subsumption of nature because I think that kind of gets a higher um, the rest of the biosphere is being transformed by capitalism. I mean to sort of the increasing intensity it seems. But it's not just um, something that we take take resources from and, and pollute into as sort of that element of transformation. Uh, you know, such that some people said we now live in the Africa scene and it's just really popular. <laughs> was there another hand over there? Yeah. Um, my question is to Anna. Um, you spoke about fertilizer when you were emphasizing how much you um, add capitalist agribusinesses. But this, this analogy, or this example that you chose, is not really reflective of, for example, the solar panel or new green technologies that fractions of, of uh, the movement are becoming more and more interested in. So, are you making the case that capitalism cannot find a fix to climate change problems? I mean, I'm not talking about like some Elon Musk situation. I'm, I'm thinking more like a passive revolution kind of thing. If capitalism faces the crisis of the climate, can it not fix it from the top down? Um, um, thank you. Yeah. Let's look at the total strategy of the strategic terrain that's facing capitalism in 2017. Outside China, capitalism is having problems reproducing itself. Point two, global warming. Point three, artificial intelligence, which brings the relations of production into conflict with the forces of production. Now, the capitalists class see AI with lust and dread. Dread because they know that it's going to have, they're going to have to restructure society. And last, because obviously for some of the needs of capitalism, <coughs> introduce the world and what they like. Fourth consideration, the changing economic hegemony between China and the United States, which is always convulsive, always convulsive. It's never a peaceful transition. Now, this is, all these four contradictions are intersecting at the same time and compounding. So I would argue that over the next decade, capitalism faces a bigger political, social, and economic crisis than the 1929 or in 1939. Very quickly on the rate of profit. Uh, on our website, I've had the really change in the rate of profit because of what's happened to the top 1% of wage earners, which are the chief executives of senior managers. And I've used Sayez's figures that are outdated to 2016 using the uh, Office of Actuary in the United States, where Sayez gets its figures from. It's gone up from 3.6% of the total wages to 14.8% which has a huge impact on the underlying rate of profit. Why is it important? Because we have a new countervailing tendency. If the shareholders decide they can no longer tolerate this theft, then in fact, in volume three, part three of Marx, Marx talks about the separation of control and ownership of capital, which creates the opportunity for senior management to thieve the assets of a company and steal from the shareholders. So Marx really foresees this. this so that's the countervailing tendency, and that's why it's important. Secondly, the question of depreciation. Now, yesterday we spoke very briefly about how WhatsApp was bought for 15 billion of Google. So Facebook goes to the IRS in the States and says, look, we bought Facebook, we bought WhatsApp for 15 billion of Google. We're going to write it off over the next 10 years. Yes, yes, boss, you can write it off over the next 10 years. So they cut one and a half billion of their profit every year and goes on to depreciation. So they then save 35% tax. So we are helping, American people are helping Facebook pay for WhatsApp. So when we look at, when we look at depreciation, 
It's gone up 50% since the information technology age. Not the uh, mid 1990s. Only half of that can be accounted for by the technical changes in the composition of, of capital. The other half is just raw. Um, and when you add that back to what's going on, and you feel what's called the rate of cash flow, or you need a corporate cash flow, which is enterprise profit, and yes, enterprise profit is absolutely important because it's a trigger. You might be the capitalism. When you add those two together, you look at the rate of cash flow. I'm sorry, comrades. Capitalism did really, really well up to 2014. It was the most prosperous age for capitalism since the Second World War. And of course it would be, because you just employ 400 million workers in Southeast Asia and pay them one tenth of the wage of the workers in the, in, in the West. Where did that money go? It went into Apple. We went to all these big American corporations, Japanese corporations, European corporations. The good news, of course, is since 2014, people don't realize how important 2014 is, both for the Chinese economy and the US economy. <coughs> the US economy, non-financial corporate profits from the second quarter of 2014 fell 35%. And they only recovered about half of that. In real terms, the mass of US corporate profits, non-financial corporate profits, is still about 14, 15% below its peak in the second quarter of 2000. So, sorry, no, thanks. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Yeah, go on. Yeah, I, was, uh, <coughs> I was pleased to hear Eduardo talk about um, what Marx was reading later on in his life, and uh, this week a lot of technology uh, uh, and the speculating about technological revolution. And I hoped that that was a prelude to some kind of discussion about method and uh, in particular scientific method. Now, it's undoubtedly the case that Marx was using uh, natural, the uh, development of natural science uh, to kind of confound the reactionaries and use it against them and, and show them a vision of the modern. Uh, but I think we, uh, uh, we, we need to rediscuss, especially when we're looking at capital 150, the, 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 the scientific method, in quotes, that we kind of uh, automatically use, or do we use, in um, political economy. Because I don't think that scientific method uh, Actually, it's only changed. Uh, Paul Hattie yesterday said, just dismiss that uh, as uh, 19th, 19th century science. Um, and I think we need to import um, the understanding into our, into our method um, and counter um, you know, orthodoxy. Uh, orthodox economics uses that, 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 that same scientific method. I think we need to um, challenge that, but also um, I'd be interested in people's uh, views on whether you can apply that scientific method uh, 19th century, as Paul described it, uh, unchanged or uh, uh, unmodified into our analysis now of that Okay, thanks, thanks very much, and thanks for a, a very rich discussion. I now don't get the speakers to come back. I usurped the chair because of the, our technical problems, so I don't want to say very much myself. Um, I haven't read Paul Mason's book, so I can't comment on it. Um, so maybe that's not having read it is a form of dismissal, but <laughs> it's a very weak form of dismissal. Um, in response to Ra Raquel, I mean, I think the question of the compatibility of capitalism in its present state and the welfare state is an issue in the North as well. One of the biggest issues in this country is the National Health Service and the way in which it's been leached by austerity, by mar marketization, and so on and so forth. So I think that the, um, the, the, um, the, the issue preserving the, the issue of a welfare state that involves 
um, receiving services of right, and the point you made yesterday against targeted ben benefits and what in this country is known as means testing is very important. This is this is a, this is an issue that any socialist pro uh, program has to address and make central to it. Okay, that's all. That's all I want to say. So let's let's hear from the the other speakers in the order in which they spoke. So I don't know if you want to. Um, so all of this. So one was about, if I understood you right, one was about the quality, the broader quality of transformation of the rest of the natural world by capital. And I focused on agriculture because Marx uses this as an example and value of capital. So I sort of use that as a starting point. But you're exactly right. We have this complete and utter transformation of global ecological systems that's result from um, capitalist production that's going on right now, such that geologists have said that we're moved out of the age of the Holocene, which was the age in which human civilization, so stable ecological conditions in which human, human civilization could even develop and exist, into the age of what geologists are deciding right now, um, whether they're going to call it the Anthropocene. They're calling it the Anthropocene because humans um, and through the productive um, system are having such an impact on their systems that it's at the scale of geological processes. It's having an impact at the scale of geological processes. So there is this, yes, much broader, um, complete qualitative and quantitative shift in the impact of um, capital on the rest of um, Earth, the Earth system. And so uh, somebody mentioned, the other question was about um, fertilizer and capitalism solve the question and find some way to get around to all of these problems. And um, you mentioned fertilizer and my use of um, the example of fertilizer. Just on that example, then I'll answer the broader question. Even in fertilizer, um, there's a group of scientists in, in Stockholm that released a paper and have updated it over time on planetary boundaries. Um, the idea that they try to introduce this framework of planetary boundaries, these key um, variables in the Earth system that if we cross any of these boundaries, um, it can destabilize the Earth system as a whole. And so, one of two of these boundaries are the phosphorus and nitrogen cycle. And so, even though there has been, we've known for a really long time, and I have a, I have a book actually coming out on this topic um, next in 2018, it's on imperialism, environmental politics, and the injustice of green capitalism. But it really traces back efforts. It, it focuses on agriculture back over 100 years. Um, but the fact is, is that even with all of the knowledge and technical, technological and scientific development, and the fact that we've had the means to reduce the use of artificial fertilizers and chemicals in agriculture for, for a very long time, if not for hundreds and hundreds of years, they were writing about this in Roman times, um, the fact is that it's just accelerated, especially in the past 50 years, even as our scientific and technological development has reached its highest point ever, it's only the problems have only gotten worse. And so we've actually surpassed um, the Earth system's limit for um, addressing the, um, the excess of nitrogen um, going back to the environment because of capitalist agriculture. So um, in terms of whether capitalism can find the fix for all of these problems, the way, the reality is, is can it solve the climate crisis? No. And that's not, that's not speculation, it just isn't. Like, what are we waiting for? There's a, it's already, you know, there's scientists, there's a study that came out last year that said the decisions we make in the next few years, like the next two or three years, will have consequences for the next millennia, ten, let me say something like 10 millennia and beyond. I mean, it's incredible. So the reality is climate, the climate crisis is already here, it hasn't been solved. And we're all already committed to a level of warming that's unsafe for um, life on the planet. We're already having that experience. So it hasn't solved the crisis. It hasn't solved any of the crises that it's caused. And so the idea that it's somehow going to shift course in the future, I, I, I see no historical evidence of that at all. And that's what all we have is that um, historical evidence in our understanding of the tendency of the capital. So, but I think the way capitalism will address the crisis and is addressing the crisis is very terrifying. So if you read the British Ministry of Defenses, 
um, strategic trends report, looking at what the military is gearing up to deal with over the next 30 years, or you look at U.S. military reports, what it's gearing up with, but the way that it's expecting to deal with the climate crisis is to close borders, um, militarily intervene, you know, where necessary, but it's a very, it's going to be a very violent um, social response from their own, from their perspective and their own words and so on. So, and I think that the capitalism has historically, as in the case of agriculture, um, I talked about the way fertilizers are used to mask the underlying problem of soil exhaustion. But I think that capitalism in all of these other realms too, it can solve a problem in one in a particular area, in a particular place and time, but it's always getting shifted either geographically to another part of the world, temporally getting shunted down the line, or socially onto another um, community, into other communities and places and so on. So that's the way capitalism responds to ecological crises. Um, I, I think that we would be in really big trouble if we were waiting on them to um, to say this in this case. So I don't know if that answered all of your questions, but I'm happy to chat with you more afterwards. Okay, try to make it short. There were several questions. Uh, I'll try to make it short. Uh, Raquel, uh, uh, the, uh, the manager's salaries on the, on the capitalist books are cost, right? They're, they are compensation of employees. They, they are not included. I mean, that's, why, that's, the, that's the point, right? That, I mean, one can, from the point of view of income, one can consider them a form of profit, right? But uh, they're not counted as profit uh, on the books of the capitalist firms. Right? And, and that is what is a more direct determinant of investments than the ability to, to uh, make that uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, in terms of your question about the, uh, the, the, the mismatch between statistics and reality, uh, I mean, I think that is, uh, I don't know about the kind of details, I haven't done that kind of detailed industrial firm study, uh, but even at the, at the general level, uh, one has to do a lot of work uh, to make the official government statistics uh, uh, consistent uh, with uh, the, uh, the Marxian concepts. Productive, unproductive labor, uh, there's no such distinction in the national income accounts, right? But in the U.S., there is a very close distinction, which is an interesting question. Why? Uh, in the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, Data, right? So one can use the BLS data to make approximations, uh, ratios uh, applied to the compensation of employees in the national income accounts. And there are other examples too. Uh, uh, there are a number of what are called imputations uh, in the national income accounts that are, that are counted as market income, market sales, uh, but they uh, are not really. They're, they're imputed. The, the, the main example is uh, uh, the rental services of owner-occupied homes, right? So uh, it, it's assumed uh, in the national income accounts, in the U.S. at least, right, that uh, 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 homes that are owned uh, by their occupants uh, treat themselves as tenants, right? And they, they rent out the... Uh, uh, the, the, the house uh, to themselves, and that rental income is included in the, the value add. So you have to subtract that. Right? Uh, um, so there, there are uh, other examples as well. Uh, Pete, Simon is right. I, I think I think Simon is right, and you're right. Uh, if you're looking at it from the perspective of the distribution of income, right? Well, so does that right? What? Well, distribution service value. Uh, well, uh, okay. I mean, yes, I'm saying it's clearly surplus value, right? The, the question is, uh, is it uh, 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 capitalist profit or not, right? And and I think from the point of view, again, from the point of view of the distribution of income, it makes sense to include that as a kind of class that way of profit. But from the point of view of business and, and business investment, uh, and uh, the, the, the profitability of investment, uh, it does not make sense. 
uh, I think, because that debt is treated on the books as a cost, right? And that is paid down. I mean, it's, it, it, is a, it is striking, right, that more and more the surplus value is going to capitalists as income, right, uh, rather than as profits. Uh, and it's almost like capitalists are cashing out. Right? <laughs> they, they see uh, what's in the future, and, and they're just kind of uh, uh, maximize their income and, and, and maximize their spending. Uh, this increase in uh, the uh, salaries, uh, uh, manager salaries, is of course consistent with the SIAS data of the top 1%, getting double digits uh, of the total uh, income. I didn't quite understand uh, your point about depreciation and, the, and the, uh, the tremendous increase in the rate of cash flow. I'd like to look at your uh, uh, data, uh, and I will. And it also didn't see, I mean, but then you also said there was this reduction uh, in absolute profits. I right? Mean, after 2014, 2014 was the peak, price peak. Right, and, but then this rate of cash flow is going up at the same time that profits are going down. Right, so that, uh, uh, I'd, I'd have to study that more. The world economy, I mean, to me, that's the big question. Uh, and, and, and clearly, you know, it, it, it's increasingly an integrated world economy. And so, uh, the, the, ultimately, the most relevant variable, as you say, is the world rate of profit, right? Uh, but uh, all we have is data on the national uh, economies, and so we do the best we can, right? And we compare, and at least for the early post-war period, the downward trend in the U.S. was true of almost everything. Country. So I think we could say with some uh, confidence that the world rate of profit uh, decline. I think it's become more problematic uh, uh, in the last several decades as the world economy has become much more integrated and uh, the outsourcing of production uh, and uh, the, the growth of uh, uh, multinational corporations around the world. Uh, and. Um, you know, as I say, this I, I really haven't worked on this in, in recent decades, but I, that is something that needs to be uh, addressed uh, as best you can. And I, I, I looked a little bit at, at one estimate I read that roughly 10% of uh, the profits of U.S. corporations are made abroad, right, uh, and are not counted in the national income statistics. Right? So this would, you know, this would raise the rate of profit another percent or two, maybe, but it wouldn't really reverse the trends uh, in the rate of profit. I know less about the, the trends and the extent of the recovery of the rate of profit in other countries, uh, but I, uh, my impression is that, uh, uh, that the, the, the trends are similar uh, to the U.S., but uh, it's, it's a very good question and a challenge for marketing research, which I think uh, it's very important to give us an idea not only what's happening to the rate of profit, but why, right? And, and what the causes are, and what the, what, what the possibilities are. Yeah, and then my final point about China. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just speak here. Okay. I mean, I agree that, I mean, uh, along with China's uh, <coughs> tremendous uh, rates of growth, development and so forth, there are serious problems. And I, you know, I, I regard uh, uh, China as a capitalist economy, and, and therefore Marxist theory applies, I would say, uh, including the falling rate of profit and, and tendency toward crises, recurring crises, right? But my question, I mean, I'm a newcomer on China. I, mean, I spent seven weeks there this summer, and I've been, you know, one more and more and more, and I'm intensely interested. Right? But my question is, I mean, it is capitalism, but it's a new form uh, of capitalism. And so it's a form of state capitalism. Uh, some might call it the highest stage uh, of, of capitalism. Uh, and and, and, and my, my kind of research and practical question, and I think maybe the most important question in the world economy today is, does this new form of capitalism uh, with its uh, state control and its state-owned banks and financial system, does this give them at least a possibility, or moral possibility, not the 
future thing, sure. Uh, but does it give them more of a possibility of managing crises uh, and uh, in ways that uh, avoid depressions? Or, I mean, China is still vulnerable to it. I mean, I know the rate of profit is declined, yet it's, as they mentioned last night, is, is 250% of GDP that has increased tremendously in the last decade, right? But they also had a big debt problem in the late 90s, right? 40% of bank loans were non-performing loans, uh, according to some Western estimates, right? 10% non-performing loans in a Western bank is a crisis. 40% right? is unheard of, right? And yet they manage somehow uh, with state policies and creating bad banks to take on these bad loans. And just their state control and state ownership gives them more, uh, more, more weapons to deal with the crisis. And it remains to be seen, but I think this is a key question, uh, is can, can they succeed or not? Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> First, where are we? Uh, just to take the idea. I think 2017, we are uh, two, in the uh, combination of two things globally. First, a new technology revolution. We don't know exactly what. It's all someone mentioned the amount of artificial intelligence, new level of operation, biotech, everything. So, something is coming. Uh, uh, so, there is a hegemonic transition now, so the uh, US is losing space for China, and I would say uh, statistically, again, that since 2012, the, so the periphery, if we add all the GDPs, the PDP, the purchasing power party, the periphery is, the GDP of the periphery is bigger. The other the, 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 the center since 2012. So this must, this might mean something we have to understand. So a combination of new technological revolution with this hegemonical transition and the challenges uh, very well uh, presented by Hunt here, the climate change challenges. Uh, so this is the configuration that we will face. Uh, the next uh, case. So, uh, with this uh, background, I go to Jim's question. Yes, I agree. Uh, uh, the, the configuration of international vision of labor is not only uh, technological revolution, it's also uh, opportunities for profit. Then I can make a little comment on that topic. Uh, if everybody is going to China, why? Because the profit rate there is big. So, probably uh, China is now with a uh, profit rate uh, bigger than the center. So, uh, I think that we have uh, to think about the profit rate. Then we go to the question on national boundaries and so on. So we have now lots of different, uh, let's say, varieties of capital. US, Europe, China is another variety. <coughs> Russia is a new variety of companies. Latin America is another variety of companies. So uh, and this blocks the formation of a world profit rate. I think that this is uh, so. We will have a world profit rate when we will have. Uh, World without, without borders. But I think that the world without borders will not be a, a, a capitalist world, so that's our fight. But okay, so uh, why don't we have borders, uh, national states, that is not possible to have a world of growth, uh, rate of growth? But okay, uh, between the change that we're having now, uh, the transnational corporations that are growing as a consequence of the, of the information technology, I would say that, 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 that there is a, one of the consequences of information technology is a new phase of growth, so the articulation of, of 
international cooperation. What is a transnational cooperation? A machine to administer to manage the law of value in different countries. So uh, one corporation will take advantage of uh, value generation throughout the world. I agree with uh, Tony's presentation yesterday that there is a change in the law of value as time will, over time there are changes and this uh, operation uh, regarding the whole world with borders uh, is important to be taken into account. And I think that transnational corporations are very important to change these uh, very uh, only national uh, foundation of, of, of greater problems. So uh, I yeah, this also uh, this is my answer to the question of, of, of uh, Janaina. I think that to understand transfer of value, we have to understand that the cooperation of the law of value in the world scene, and it is something that I personally would have to research, uh, investigate, understand. And I think that who could be a good starting point for this is uh, Eugene Preobaginski. Uh, he has a very interesting <coughs> revelation on the changes in the law of value and the law of value international markets and so on. So that uh, could be a, a starting point, but this would be the other Okay, so these are about uh, national bodies. Information technology, they are going to be the question. Uh, I've, I've read all this in the book, uh, interesting, uh, but I think that he's talking not about post companies, probably a new phase of company. Uh, something uh, I think, uh, <laughs> begin with that. That's, that's uh, to end capitalism, is something that uh, probably the, the last uh, session uh, talking about <coughs> able to uh, enlighten us about what is uh, our struggle. And, uh, Okay, but uh, I think that uh, we have the, the impact of uh, information technology is huge. I think that uh, going to Carlo Capelli's uh, points, the, the big names, as the 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 the, the whole team was for the second, that uh, one My guess is that the the big bang for this phase was the creation of the World Wide Web. In Brazil, 1993. So everything uh, now we're living the consequence of that, and that probably is a reference because it did create a new continent for capital accumulation. The digital world—it's a, a new continent. Now capitalism took all the blood, but now we have a new uh, continent to be populated. Used by a population of capital. And remember again uh, Tony's presentation yesterday, who are the great, uh, the, the leading firms now? Uh, Facebook, Apple, Google is there uh, uh, leading the population of capital in that new continent. So, new phase, uh, I would say, technological revolutions are a very strong counter tendency to the fall of profit rate. We shape capitalism uh, uh, again, 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 again. A new starting point yeah, is the title of the, the presentation, and I think that uh, the information technology probably is offering us a new starting point for capitalism. And so <coughs> we need to reorganize our struggles to help recompose of our problem uh, for an alternative to capitalism because capitalism is changing, therefore we have to change the, uh, our programmatic elaboration. And uh, uh, the question on science, uh, uh, so two things to conclude. But uh, my Marx was building that, we had to think a lot of struggle with his Certainly, he would like to follow science. He was very curious about that. Uh, and I would go to Napoleon Rosenberg, a huge material that uh, said that the Marx vision of science is very interesting, uh, or how the relations and so on. 
So uh, these signs that you are describing could be very useful, could have very useful applications. Uh, so in one thing. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, probably I, I guess that uh, he was uh, reading, he was looking for the, the babages and the, the youths, the, the guys that help him to understand machinery, to understand chemistry, electricity, and so on. Is, is the guess. But, uh, so the, I, I think this is a very interesting point to, to go uh, but to conclude, uh, I use your question uh, to, to make a, a final comment on the way of Because uh, probably, uh, this, this is another thing, uh, my group, the uh, group that I work we have a paper on the way of the rate of profit and then we discuss that the important as well. But the point is that when we uh, uh, when we organize a, a system of equations uh, using uh, facts and sites, let's say in sites, uh, on the delta in sites in, in session, third session of volume three, uh, one equation for the rate of profit going down, another equation to the rate of profit going up, the counter minutes, and another equation doing what Alex would call the interplay between the, the two, uh, these two uh, factors, let's say. So, uh, the math problem, the, the greatest contribution of math to the discussion of the rate of profit is this simultaneity of operation between these two uh, different tenants and the common tenants. So, that's the. What, what, why am I telling you? Because, uh, Organizing this, what is the result? The result is a world of non-linearity, and we reach uh, so this, uh, this, work, this work is done together with the physicists. So we reach uh, the world of complexity, the physics of complexity, and so on. So uh, the idea is that Marx was ahead of his time. Uh, so the mathematics uh, to, to elaborate what this insight was, uh, this insight presented. In volume three, on the left and second world war arrived. So uh, I think that there is uh, something that uh, Max is uh, uh, a researcher of the world of complexity. And capitalism is, uh, is part of it's a complex thing, uh, and that's the point that we reach this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are running very late, uh, and we need to fix the, um, the whatever's wrong with the sound system. So now we're going to break for lunch. Um, let's try and start again. We were supposed to start at 1.30. Let's try and start at 1.40. Okay? Thanks very much.